welcome to the discussion on one of the most important topics in corrosion of metals and alloys. Uh, the topic of discussion is um, stress corrosion cracking. So far, we had um, looked at the corrosion of metals uh, from a perspective where there are no applied stresses acting on the metal. We discussed uh, the galvanic corrosion where you had dissimilar metals coming in contact with each other electrically and we said that the, the anodic member of the couple will undergo the corrosion aided by the cathodic member. We then uh, went on to discuss uh, the crevice corrosion in the structure when you form a crevice because of the uh, fabrication issues, the crevice is uh, act as sites of corrosion. We looked at the, uh, the passive metals and uh, we said that the passive film can break down under certain uh, conditions may be a mechanical damage or it could be due to uh, the specific ions present in the environment leading to pitting corrosion. Then we looked at what happens uh, when there are the transformation in the material especially in stainless steels that leads to sensitization. We look at the intergranular corrosion of the stainless steel and these relevance to uh, welding and fabrication. The intergranular corrosion again uh, not only confined to stainless steels um, it can happen in any other material uh, more so in magnesium alloys and aluminum alloys and copper based alloys when the grain boundaries are becoming electrochemically active. Um, in all in all these cases we also assumed that uh, yeah there is one more case we also discussed where we call as selective leaching and uh, de-alloying. In all these cases, we assumed that the environment is static in relation to the material and we look at what happens if the environment moves in relation to the structure to the material. Then we had looked at um, three different forms of uh, corrosion and flow assisted corrosion, erosion, corrosion damage the cavitation damage we talked about where the environment we considered was the fluid it could be a gas it could be a liquid and of course in all these cases you can have a suspension of the solids but essentially it is a fluid. We uh, looked at one more case where the, the contact surfaces are in motion. Okay in the contact surfaces in this case are a solid state right they are solids one metal against another metal and one metal against another ceramic for example. When they are relatively moving and when they are under load conditions what kind of corrosion in occurs we call them as a fretting damage. The loading conditions that are acting on this on these contact surfaces only you know uh, they are not considered in terms of what happens in the bulk, the load, the stresses that happens in the bulk were not considered. In fact, these uh, you know contact surfaces uh, the interface the loading is the predominant factor. But you know most often the engineering metals and alloys 
are made for structural applications they the bear the load right beat a, a ship a pipeline or a reactor could be a pressure vessel for example or could be aircraft or I mean you can name quite a few actually. In all these cases the metallic structures are experiencing certain amount of stresses. You can also start classifying stresses into different categories it could be a tensile stress, it could be a fatigue stress or it could be a really a torsion test you know stress can happen. So, when you have this when you also have an environment acting on the surface the failure mechanisms are different and they have very serious consequence. In fact, you would see that the metal hardly corrodes in terms of visible changes loss in weight is hardly seen at all, but it can lead to cracking it can lead I mean, as a result of which it can be leaking and you know and structural instability and there could be safety issues involved. So, what we are going to look at in this particular maybe today and in a couple of days is how a metal under tensile loading condition and also exposed to the environment respond to it ok. What is the mechanism of such corrosion process and what are the factors that affect such a kind of corrosion and how do you prevent them and if there are any kind of fingerprints characteristics of that form of corrosion is also important. So, these aspects we are going to see. So, before I go into it I just want to show certain illustration how uh, the corrosion can really affect in practice. This in fact is an ongoing work which we have been do we are doing now. This is uh, the reactor in fact, it is a pressure vessel I would say is high pressure. It is uh, meant to produce an aromatic compound you know most of you know the aromatic compounds are you know as a special characteristics and they are synthesized using uh, inputs which are mostly organic and maybe sometime you may add sodium hydroxide you may add water. They are subjected to high temperature high pressure conditions. The reactor that you are seeing here do not worry about all this inlets outlets all this stuffs actually ok. Because there are you see they feed hydrogen you know when you feed hydrogen then there are a lot of precautions that you have to take constantly do it. So, there are so many ports. It was made up of um, 304L stainless steel. The company wanted to increase the production, they went from a smaller reactor to a bigger reactor. In just 4 months, just 4 months of its inception commissioning ok, the reactor start leaking. And I do not think uh, you know when you have hydrogen you really would like to take risk of that actually. And if you if I look at it look at the inner walls of the um, reactor uh, normally you do NDT right NDT is one um, very versatile NDT is uh, dye penetrant test. So, some of you are aware of it right you apply a dye on the on the surface and you wipe them out and you can just uh, you know you also add uh, another elutant to the surface and and so the the dye comes to the surface and wherever is a crack the dye penetrates and comes back to this. So, you will able to see this you know the subsurface cracks um, 
even surface cracks um, using the diperentin test. Um, when you take a cross section of that, you see how the cross section looks like. I do hope you will able to see very fine cracks starting from the surface and moving towards this. It is a very thick vessel of 50 millimeter thickness. It is a, it's a 304 L stainless steel and you find that it just failed in 4 months. If you look at little bit more in detail at a higher magnification ok and you will find the cracks are microscopic in nature and the microscopic cracks turned into a macroscopic failure ok. And uh, you, you guys now are reasonably familiar with metallurgy you see that these cracks are all branching now and you see some of them are called transgranular cracks ok. We will come back to this soon. So, 4 months time and the reactor started failing. This is a heat exchanger um, ok you know this is a kind of uh, schematic of that ok. And um, it is called as a air condenser right. You want to dry the air. So, you need to you know and uh, you know especially when see what happens you know um, in industry every heat is important right. You 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 burn you create heat you just do not want to let it out right. You take the heat out from that okay. heat is essentially energy right. So, the air comes out of the reaction process you need to remove the heat because it costs money and this is a the condenser right air condenser right. It takes the heat and it is called as a um, as a uh, cooling water system ok. So, what you do here is that you can see here that there is an inlet here ok. It goes inside this outlet here and it is a horizontal heat exchanger and it is made up of um, 304L the stainless steel. The air inlet the temperature is about 150 to 160 degree Celsius at a pressure of uh, 1 uh, 10 kg uh, you know uh, centimeter square and you have a cooling water uh, you know enters here and comes out air ent enters here and then it comes out here ok. It is a counter current process right it is what happens. The material used was uh, 304 L stainless steel it is a fertilizer company and the cooler in operation was for 6 to 7 years not longer. And the tubes which are inside 63 of them started leaking at all actually. Hmm. That was a problem. So, it is all premature failure right you just take these tubes and see the tubes in a you know in a, in a microscope. This is the cross section of the tube you see here the crack started from the external thing where the water went went through the water went through this ok. So, from wherever the you know because the surface is you know is covered with water and you start you know cracking this is called a cooling water this is not a distilled water it is of course, a pure water but not not like your DM water. Again uh, you see a kind of branching of cracks uh, this is one of the characteristics of stress corrosion cracking. And if you know uh, you know uh, if you do a tensile testing or if you have the mechanical loading is a failure you only see a one crack the cracks are not branching at all. Uh, the, the crack morphologies we will discuss shortly and this is also some way some kind of a trans granular cracks taking place. Look at this um, in a in a scanning electron microscope in in detail see the surface is the surface is uh, is quite a uh, brittle surface right it is a brittle surface it is a brittle surface. And uh, those guys who are uh, with the metallurgy background you will able to you will appreciate you will able to understand what brittle fracture is. 
and those who are not from the metallurgy background I want to show how a normal fracture should look like in scanning ultra microscope ok. You see this here this is a material failed in air in the absence of environment it is a tensile failure and hope you can see this is called a fibrous failure it is called a dimple failure and dimple fracture and you can see the fibers you know the metal has nicely elongated they are they are just flow nicely flow right. So, uh, this is the kind of ductal fracture you see um, when you have um, when you have uh, you know simply failure in air. I suppose that it looks like a glass that failed here ok. So, the problem in stress corrosion cracking is that it can cause a premature failure and it can lead to certainly see it, it is not going to cause too much of corrosion see here now the surface ok. This is the surface internally and you do not really see much of corrosion at all I hope you were able to see this clearly now it is almost, but then wherever there is a crack 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 happen and subsequent place you are not seeing any any corrosion. So, visually they are not undergoing severe uniform corrosion at all and so, this corrosion is very localized and uh, is called as a stress corrosion cracking. Now, stress corrosion cracking has been a, a really a problematic thing actually it is a um, it is a problematic thing and in fact, if you look at the history historical perspective of that. I am not going to discuss there is a, a paper by Sergei Siplov I think give a reference later and he has given very nicely the history of um, of uh, stress corrosion cracking. Actually in the year 1873 at Manchester. A guy called Williams H. Johnson. He did a very interesting, curious experimentation. What he did was um, he took steel. Okay. And then it dipped in hydrochloric acid okay. and, and also in sulfuric acid, both the acids. He did a nice just dip it and then he carried out a, a tensile test. He found ductility reduced significantly. In the year um, nineteen, uh, sorry, eighteen. 74, uh, another interesting person and uh, Osborne Reynolds. He did a very other interesting experiment he found that ductility loss is can be reversible. You expose it to the environment and do um, 
tensile testing and you see there is a loss in ductility, but you just leave it for quite some time in air. He says that you do a test after, after a few months and major part of the ductility loss can be recovered actually. That was a very interesting experiment that was done. Now, subsequently and in, uh, in the year 1886, the guy called Roberts Austin, what he did was he took um, 22 carat gold. and drawn into a wire it and then he exposed to ferric chloride the wire got cracked. Probably this is well, the first uh, you know such observation which talks about the so called stress corrosion cracking. Huh? The earlier uh, observations they pertain to hydrogen damage, hydrogen embrittlement, we will talk about later. So, they were all academic experiments, they are, all, they are more academic and the importance of such kind of loss in mechanical properties. You see what is here? There is a loss in ductility taking place. They are not realized. They started realizing it in the early 20th century. That is a time where there was industrial revolution taking place right lot of you know technologies were developed actually and it so happened the, inv the invention of steam driven <coughs> locomotives right the steam driven locomotives first saw the problem of stress corrosion cracking, how severe it can be right. Now, it is simple water and you generate a steam and that is used to drive the locomotives. Now, it is used same steam is used now to generate electric power right. Now, people have used electric powers. Now, this is a problem because you see here this is very mind boggling 1865 to 1870 288 boilers in UK and in 1867 to 868 we had 441 boilers in USA exploded. It was really kind of you know and you know you see the consequence of explosion right the pressure vessel actually and the steam at that temperature pressure lot of casualties actually. How it happened? The steam uh, locomotives made up of steel, I mean not locomotives, I am sorry, the boilers made up of steel and they are fabricated using what? How they fabricated? Using rivets, 
right. What is then you put a seed and then you uh, you put a rivet and then you you just what you are you cold compress it right. There will be more stresses there will be lots of residual stresses in the system and you know when you when you use water for the boilers the the pH is increased otherwise what happens the steel will corrode right. The pH used to be around about 10 or so and then what happens when when you when you boil the water you take the steam out what will happen to whatever remains in the boiler. How do you make the pH of the water higher? You add sodium hydroxide right and you increase the pH to let us say 10 and you you boil and evaporate. So, what happens now with the time the sodium hydroxide concentration increases and then it leads to cracking. So, thus the name emerged we call as caustic embrittlement. The caustic embrittlement now we all know that it is simple mechanism of stress corrosion cracking right, but those days they called a caustic embrittlement because wherever the caustic accumulated. See what happens when you when you have a sheet and then you join them like that right, join them like this and you put a rivet, you put a rivet here ok and this gap there will be accumulation of the accumulation of the sodium hydroxide and start given as to crack. Historically, there are one more incident that was that also brought the attention of the people. Season cracking of brass cartridges. You know um, it is a bullet right and you you mount a you mount a bullet right you you crimp here right ok this is hard one maybe steel or something like that ok. This is made up of brass. So, they you know what happened was the cartridges started cracking during the winter time. See they, they were stressed in India first actually because the British found that uh, they found that these cartridges failed during the during winter and monsoon time you know winter and monsoon. time where uh, you know what happens to organic suppose you have organics they decompose and then they generate ammonia the ammonia cause cracking of brasses. So, these are uh, the names uh, given to stress corrosion cracking because they are associated with certain events ok and they are all in fact uh, can come under stress corrosion cracking of of uh, of metals. Why why is that you should worry about stress corrosion cracking? Why bother about stress corrosion cracking? We have I think some mechanical engineers right background right I think. I give a, a material and I ask you to use that material to design some structure say maybe a pipeline or maybe a foot over bridge 
थोड़ा वो आ रहा है ओके सो वॉट इनपुट पैरामीटर्स डू यू टेक टू डिजाइन दिस स्ट्रक्चर्स ऑफ द मटीरियल राइट ओकोस इट हैज टू टेक सर्टन लोड ओके सो द लोड्स आर गिवन टू यू ओके सो वॉट इनपुट parameters of the materials you would consider yeah yield stress yield strength right then ultimate tensile strength then you look at the ductility in terms of the elongation right these parameters of course you can also look at the toughness which is k1c value and do that right so you look at the yield strength of the material ultimate tensile strength of the material look at the elongation that happens at all and then you can look at the k1c value which is called as a the toughness so the parameters the the mechanical parameters okay uh of interest to design a structure one could be yield strength to ultimate tensile strength Three, the elongation. Elongation two, failure, right? Failure. Four, the fracture toughness. If you design a structure wherein the load. does not cross the yield strength of a material right suppose i use a steel and carbon steel was what maybe a 200 megapascal 250 megapascal is the carbon steel strength right yield strength and and ultimate tensile strength maybe about 400 megapascal something like that and the elongation maybe around about 18% so range of things that have so suppose i design a, a structure such that the load does not lead to a stress level beyond the yield strength of the steel what happens it will endure it will endure forever because it is within the elastic limit it doesn't undergo any plastic deformation right it is within the within the elastic limit so it suppose you endure or wrong suppose you have an environment come in contact with this structures can fail well below yield strength it can it can happen even at about 25% 30% of we say are not all cases i'm saying there are cases that the metal can fail at about 25% 20% of the yield strength now crack can grow cracks can grow well below k1c fracture so toughness is k1c right elongation is given as epsilon sigma uts and sigma u strength that is because um, the elongation loss k1 
can be 60 to 70 percent I can know I can lose my elongation 60 to 70 percent. So, what does it mean? If I lose that elongation that is what is going to be elongation means what? That is right the ability of the metal to manage any distortion in the structures that could happen during the load bearing things is not it it could happen right. So, if there are going to be a distortion and if the metal is not plastically deforming then what happens like a glass you can just simply crack. So, you can lead to a brittle that only talks about the safety right the safety here is depend upon how ductile how tough they are actually. So, if it is going to be brittle then safety becomes a casualty. So, stress corrosion cracking is a problem and for the structures where you expect it could it could suffer ok you could suffer through that particular failures. And look at what is stress corrosion cracking. It is conjoint action of tensile stress and corrosive environment. acting on metals it can also happen in materials also it can happen even in glasses it could happen in polymers but most of the engineering materials we you know we deal with and especially these cores we discuss more on metals ok but it is just not confined only to metals and alloys materials can happen ceramics can fail, glasses can fail, polymers also can undergo stress corrosion cracking because the environment can can interact with them. So, you have three players here one is material other is the the environment that is the stresses. I mean I mean stresses I mean here the tensile stresses ok. It is not a fatigue it is not a fatigue stress not a shear or I mean we are not talking about the torsion. Uh, and we are not talking about um, you know compression all these kind of <coughs> things. And all this lead to SCC So, it is a synergy taking place please look at it is a synergy right it is it is it is not a cumulative that corrosion means this much loss in weight in air the metal undergo this much of tensile strength it is not additive it is it is it is a synergy. And also not much loss in in weight due to corrosion. Now, this is a, a Venn diagram we call it a Venn diagram. 
Now you look at this there are three players here the material the environment I mean the chemical environment here I suppose we define the beginning of the course itself we are not talking about physical environment we always talk about the chemical environment when it comes to corrosion and we talk about the tensile stresses. So, in order to understand stress corrosion cracking we need to look at the material aspect the environment aspect here and we need to also uh, address the the stresses. So, all three we need to be understanding in order to get a picture about stress corrosion cracking and then to say how we can control the stress corrosion cracking. Stress corrosion cracking can be taught maybe some 10, 12, 15 lectures more actually. So, we will be very, very brief and uh, you know at best we will take about uh, 3 classes and try to see you know how we can understand stress corrosion cracking um, uh, of metals and alloys. Now, let us go into um, the first aspect of the cracking. The types of cracking whatever be the cracking whatever be the types of cracking the cracking is always brittle in nature. The brittle is a very qualitative term you know it is very difficult to define what a brittle is right. I do not think there is can be say anything which is 100 percent brittle and you cannot say anything as 100 percent ductile kind of things. So, it is a character of the material actually. What is the character here? What is mean by brittle as opposed to ductile? What do you mean by that? Let us look at from the perspective of what happens to the metal and you deform it actually right. Sir, can we say that brittleness is that there will be no elongation before the crack propagation can take place. So, there will be no ok what is mean by no elongation right ok what is mean by no elongation? Local yielding at the surface ok there is no local yielding at the surface ok more ok all right you are right what does what is happening that means that essentially there is no atomic mobility taking place essentially in the success. When you apply a stress the atoms start moving that is what you call a plastic right we call a plastic deformation right. So, plastic deformation we call it. When does the plastic deformation occur? When the stress applied is greater than the thing. That is where the dislocations move, the atoms move you know the mobility of atoms are related to the mo mobility of the dislocations right. So, only above the yield point dislocations move and through which the atoms move and so there is going to be going to be plastic deformation the metal takes the shape that you want it right. In the elastic limit uh, there is no atomic mobility is not going to be there. If the metal fails in the elastic regime, then it becomes a brittle. ok. Why? Because there is no essentially atoms do not move at all. If the stress corrosion crack in the environment facilitates the crack initiation and crack growth below the yield point, then what happens? then the metal will behave something like a glass because they do not really move at all. Am I right or not? So, the fracture process depends upon at what stress level 
the metal fails. If it fails close to ultimate tensile stress, then what happens? It is going to be nice full ductile. If it fails in somewhere between yield point and UTS, depending upon where it fails, the extent of ductility is going to change. Okay. So, it is a qualitative parameters, I do not want to uh, you know discuss too much on it, ok. But I want you to get a feel for that, right. That means if the metal can fail below yield point, you can get nice brittle cracks occurring on the metals, but not necessarily always the metal fails in that manner. Now, let us look at at a microscopic level, how does the crack propagate? That is a macroscopic level, right. At a microscopic level, how does the crack propagate? We all know we deal with polycrystalline material right. Now, the crack can grow along this way, we call it as transgranular crack. In fact, the most of the mechanical failure happens in the air are all transgranular cracks, but they are transgranular ductile cracks, ok. Here you also have you know transgranular, but then these are transgranular brittle fractures. The crack also can go It can grow along and what is this called? Intergranular cracks. I will go back to the some slides which I have shown you before so that you get a clarity in terms of what is mean by transgranular cracks and intragranular cracks. I hope uh, this is the uh, slightly at higher magnification, lower magnification, this is the higher magnification. Now, I hope you were able to see the grains here, ok. Now, look at this the crack grows straight you know cuts across all the grains ok. So, it is a transgranular crack, so it is here. You see that in the scanning microscope, uh, it is it is it is the. Please look at this is the um, this is the uh, this is not the crack uh, interface, right? You can you can break open this. This is a crack plane. This is a crack plane. Huh? This is a crack plane. In the this is the plane through which the crack is moving now. Now look at this. This becomes totally 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 transgranular cracking, and I hope you are able to see some grains here, grains here there are grains here, there are grains here. Now, you can see this also there is a grain here. So, the crack cuts across the, the grains. So, they become transgranular cracks in nature. Look at this and this is a clear intergranular cracks ok. Look at the grain here, the grain here crack grows along the grain boundary ok. Why? The grains are got sensitized, you can see this here, the grains got sensitized, the crack grows along this. So, it is it is a it is a surface, the surface of the specimen see that. You open this, you break open this, you look at the crack plane, you will able to see the nice grains which are not elongated right. You can look at this, right? these are all grains, grains you see the grain facets 
you can see the clear, clear grain facets, grain facets. The grain facets means the grains are not deformed like a sugar, um, the sugar grains you see that right. So, they are not deformed, they are, they are you know, uh, I mean the, the corrosion has occurred selectively along the grain boundary and the crack starts moving along the grain boundary. So, the grain boundaries are relatively electrochemically active. I use the term electrochemically active because it can be an anodic can happen, it can even sometimes can even can have cathodic that happens in hydrogen embrittlement case. But so, uh, if the if the the preferential dissolution takes place here ok and um, and so, the grains are not deformed and and you see a huge amount of um, intergranular uh, cracking taking place. This is one way of looking at it. There are cases where it is not necessarily 100 percent intergranular, 100 percent transgranular, it could be a mixed kind of failure can happen right. So, um, so this is what really happens. In all these cases, the failure is called as I hope you heard of the term called cleavage failure. What is the cleavage failure? Anybody has any idea? lattice that I have right. When you apply force atoms start moving when you have dislocations, you know dislocations of course, difficult for that to move. Now, when you when you pull it now ok, assume that I, I use a scissor, I cut this bond, cut this bond, I cut this bond, I cut this bond, I cut this bond. If I cut this bond what happens now? this piece becomes separate, this becomes a separate that means, atoms are intact, the positions are not changed because these are weakened now. So, the cleavage fracture means essentially the bond between the atoms are broken well before the atoms could displace from their positions ok. So, this what we call in the cleavage fractures that what happened in the grain boundaries what happens? The atoms cleave right. You have one grain, another grain in between the atoms they just cleave out can happen. That happens um, but of course, here in this case corrosion can lead to that happens, but you also have intergranular cracking taking place in in air also right. You all you talk about temper embrittlement all this stuffs there ok. So, so um, they are all cleavage fractures the atoms are or you know the bonds between the atoms are or I can say poor cohesive strength. It can happen and it can lead to this kind of failures. So, it is very important to understand the nature of cracking in a stress corrosion cracking failures. Otherwise, you can get mislead. You may consider that as what it could be you know normal tensile failure ok. So, cracking mode is a one of the one of the signatures of stress corrosion cracking. Now, if you do not identify that then you will not identify the problem you know let me just spend a minute and then I will I will I think I will close this today's discussion. This one or or you get a yeah you if if you find that a crack like this the both of this are done what is called as you you guys already studied uh, sensitization right it is a stainless steel they carried out ASTM 
A262 A test was done. Okay. You do not see any sensitization here. You see the sensitization taking place here, right? Here also you have ASTM A262 A test, right? But there are also sensitization taking place. So, the alloy failed by brittle fracture case 1 and the case 2, but the reason for failure are different, right. The reason for failure in this case it is improperly solution annealed or improperly welded whatever kind of thing. Here uh, everything looks ok, but the alloy is not good enough for the environment ok. So, the way you diagnose the problem is different. In this case you say it is not the metallurgy is not adequate for the severity of the environment ok. You need to change the alloy. Here the primary cause seems to be sensitization right. The sensitization is related to carbon content, welding, improper solution and treatment so many factors are going to be there. So, you need to understand how the cracking take place before we can come to a conclusion what is the root cause of the problem in stress corrosion cracking ok. So, um, so we have seen now the, the crack morphologies the crack uh, natural cracking and uh, we will end our discussion today.